Hey guys, welcome to the Best Practices Show, where we take a look at the best business practices from the best dental practices all across the country. And I've got one of my favorite people on today, the authority on Perio, Dr. Sam Lau. We're going to be talking about the perfect 60-minute hygiene appointment. So if you struggle with this, you're not going to want to miss this. So grab a pen and hit the share button. We'll see you in a second. Hey guys, welcome back to the Best Practices Show, and I am so grateful you're watching. We have people all over the world watching the show, and we're just having so much fun bringing in the best authorities from the best practices all over the country, and today's no exception. I got my good friend, Dr. Sam Lau on. Now, a couple notes before we get started. This is a hot topic on the 60-minute hygiene appointment. We are shooting this live on Facebook, so as you see the feed and you're watching this live, Feel free to add a question on the side. We love your questions. As a matter of fact, we love the questions so much. We're getting people ask questions. Um, we're giving away an Apple iWatch every single week to the best question because I think questions are the answer. Fully loaded with all the episodes and then two free tickets to activate, which you're not going to want to miss also. So please ask us great questions. Um, and today... A lot of you might struggle with what happens in hygiene. Hygiene becomes one of the most important pieces of any great restorative practice. And so I thought I'd bring my buddy on and we'll just go right into the face of the storm and have him answer it correctly. But I got a chance to meet Dr. Sam Lau years ago at the Panky Institute. And I was going through the early stages and this guy just completely changed the way I thought about periodontal disease, uh, the role of great perio in restorative dentistry. And so Sam, I'm so grateful you're on, buddy. Thank you for being on. Well, thank you, Eric. I really appreciate it. Uh, we're going to have a good time today and, and uh, take that, that, uh, Recare, recall appointment out of the doldrums and make it fun, make it uh, create a wonderful opportunity for the practice. Absolutely. And if somebody doesn't know who Dr. Sam Lau is, Sam, who are you? Uh, well, I'm a speaker consultant. I left the University of Florida as an associate dean. I still practice I'm on the board at Panky, on the board at the Academy of Laser Dentistry. I've been involved in organized dentistry. It's my my life, my hobby, my passion, and we're not going to stop anytime soon. <laughs> hey, man, you are on the go. I see you everywhere, buddy. So um, now I want to talk about why this is such a hot topic because I let we in our company and when we coach offices, we don't refer to the hygienist as any, you know, we don't even use the word cleaning. You taught me don't ever use the word cleaning. We were, and we don't even look at them as really. Like just as it, they, the hygienist is such an important restorative partner, a partner in every aspect of the practice. But this is a hot topic because some dentists don't see the same value and some hygienists don't see their role as valuable. What do you see? I see a dental hygienist being an integral part of that 60 minute appointment. They are almost, uh, without getting too political, almost like a uh, nurse practitioner, physician's assistant. Uh, they're there. Uh, in fact, when we look at the anatomy of that 60 minute appointment in a moment, we're going to find that that dentist is probably only in there about five to 10 minutes at most. Uh, and I'm sure you, you, uh, uh elucidate on that too, Kirk. You, yeah. We can't have dentists, uh, taking chair time away, being in the hygiene operatory. So we're going to, we're going to act, uh, on a, a totally different kind of dynamic where that hygienist has all that information. We're going to even talk about when the dentist actually comes into that uh, operatory and when they should leave. So on average, about at the most five minutes is about the most time that dentist is going to be in there. Because, you know, there, there's an elephant in the room on this thing. And that is, uh, and I know many of the folks that are on this program today, they're not in this category. But every now and then you see a dentist come into see that patient in the hygiene operatory and the patient says, well, who are you? I haven't seen you in so long. And actually it created uh, to a, such a point that even some state state laws have something like the 13 month rule. Well, 
I know our viewers today, they're not in that kind of deal, but for the most part, we want that patient having the experience of really who is the captain of the ship. So if the, if the person sort of moving those oars or the hygienist, uh, they're not the captain. The, the dentist is the captain. And so we got to continue reinforcing with that whole practice. The icon of that practice is the dentist. Yeah. Uh, now and then I see some of these practice names. You know, everything has to do with the teeth, a smile, a bright, or something like this. Uh, but I still believe, don't, don't forget that it is the practitioner that seals the deal. That's who they come to see if you want to build that kind of practice. Now, if you want to practice where you're only producing a commodity, filling a hole, well, then you can call it whatever you want. But uh, we're not going to do that today. This is going to be a whole different deal by the time that 60-minute thing is through. Uh, they know that they are willing to come back and they're going to pay that fee because they got a meaningful appointment and not just as you suggested, a cleaning. Right. Now I want to piggyback on what you just said, because it would be really easy for us to you, you and I just go on the how, how you do this, how, 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 but really what you're pointing out is this is a leadership issue as a dentist. You've got to decide what happens in your practice in each one of these rooms. That's your call because I see this, Sam, a lot of times people say, well, I can't practice that way. They don't want to do this or insurance won't let me. And I think if you're a young dentist watching this, who's 32 struggling with this, I think the first thing to do is say, Hey, look, how do I want to experience myself in dentistry? And how do I want these patients? to be taken care of and then we can work through the how would you agree absolutely i you know you're not gonna in today's practice you're not gonna start off with a fee-for-service practice right. but you're gonna but but what you're going to do is create categories of patients to where you you're managing all kinds of patients uh that that's up to you the bottom line is though you still have to make money at the end of the month right. and so therefore you decide what what kind of the quantity within each bucket uh, but I would never suggest to you, uh, to anyone out there, that uh, we are having an influence on just one particular bucket. We're going to take this 60-minute thing and we're going to adapt it to whether it's a third-party uh, practice, uh, whether it is a fee-for-service practice, where it's a combination of both, which is the most common. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're, we're going to find those sleeper opportunities and we're going to take it away from just what a hygienist does at the chair. And you're gonna hear me constantly talk about, it's going to be a pie. And the pie, we're gonna look at the pie. And the pie is gonna be 60 minutes. Um, the pie can't get any bigger, can't get any smaller. What we're gonna do is work on the slices within the pie. Right. And about those slices in the pie, what is going to really be such a change in the paradigm is where hygienists will spend uh, maybe 60, 70, 80% of their time at the chair. You're going to find by the time we finish, they're only going to be spending 25 to 30 minutes of the 60 with the other 30 minutes doing things to build the practice, educate the patient, and move it forward. So I'm sure maybe some folks are going to be intrigued on how <laughs> I can take this and move this into 30 minutes. Yeah. And, uh, and some of the stuff I'm going to present to you is uh, some things I haven't presented before, but congealed them just for you today, just for you, Kirk, just for just for this group. Um, that's that's and, why I love you. You get me thinking all the time. What revolutionary, because if it's okay with you, I'm going to talk about some products and uh, try to be as generic as I can. Uh, but we're going to talk about some different systems when it comes to that at the chair. Yeah. That's awesome. So take us through this. Where do I start? Okay, because I got my pie and I've got, so just draw a circle. And I would imagine if you're watching this, do the same thing. So I got a pie, I got a dot in the middle, and I'm guessing we're going to start right at the top of the pie. Is that right? Right. And I'm going to sort of, if you don't mind, every now and then I'm going to reference to my, uh, my little uh, menu here. So when I got when my eyes dart over, we're going to talk about the 60 minute recare appointment. So got first it. of all, you'll notice I didn't call it a recall appointment. Yes. You know, you recall appliances that don't work. Uh, this is not a recall. This is recare. So you probably have heard that term before. Uh, if you haven't, uh, those of you out there, uh, don't call it a recall. Because recall is like my blender needs to go back to what, you know, well, needs to go back to another country. But I won't go there. But uh, the but this is recare appointment. Recare means we're taking care. And 
On our last uh, uh, get together, you may you you know you recall and you reinforced that I kept saying, "Don't treat people anymore. Manage." Right. And this uh, this sixty minute is going to fit right into that central theme. So, the first thing is, you know, we're going to meet and greet naturally. Uh, when we talk about that, I give about five minutes to seat that patient. Uh, that means, uh, you know, and if you're really a quality practice, uh, you, that hygiene is out there in that in the reception area, not in the waiting area. If we call it a waiting area, it means they're waiting out there. Uh, by the way, and this, and if you remind me, Kirk, as we go through this, but yeah. one of the things that's going to be really, really critical here is we can't keep people waiting. Right. We cannot keep people waiting in 2017. It's just unacceptable. Right. And part of that is we're in a society where, you know, I, I might have mentioned, you know, you go through McDonald's, you're in, you know, you're in the, in the drive, drive through. If you're waiting more than one minute, I mean, you are, you are totally impatient, aren't you? Right. Well, they got sure. that little, uh, that little uh, parking area over there. You know, you go over to that dreaded parking area and they're going to have to bring out your food. That's probably going to be the last time you're going to that McDonald's. Right. So we have in this thing called the 15 minute rule. You cannot leave a patient out there more than 15 minutes. Now, let me just reinforce something. As I'm saying this, there's not a lot of science, but this is just going to be a little bit of dogma. When I go in to do uh, in office perio consulting, this is what I've learned. This is the way we've managed our practice. So if we're if we're going to keep them out there more than 15 minutes late, then they have the opportunity to come in more than 15 minutes late. That's right. the way the thing works. Yeah. This is now now here we go. Yeah. Now let me go back to that because I want to piggyback on that, Sam, because that's so important. You have to in order for you to be able to keep a good quality hour, you have to start on time. And we always say this to our clients: when you're not on time, it screams you don't care like you and no matter what's going on in your practice i don't care what your excuse is when you show up late you're screaming i don't care and the other thing is you teach people how to treat us which is exactly what you said when you're 15 minutes late you're giving them full permission to be late and to kick you in the shins the next time they come back so you don't want to do that that's right you know it's behavior and you know I'll, as an example i uh, if, if when i see a physician and he or she is always 15, 20, 30 minutes, 45 minutes late. Well, when, when I have a one o'clock appointment, do you think I get there at one o'clock? No, I start acting like they do. So right. I start coming in at one fifteen. Why should I be there at one? All I'm going to do is just read a bunch of outdated magazines. Right. So for the most part, I'm right there with you and you're, you're right on target. And so we're going to talk today because... There are many, there are several reasons why a hygienist runs late, but that should, that is absolutely zero defect intolerant. Right. I mean, I'm just going to be, you know, you, you mentioned before about how some practitioners will say, well, you know, I have to do this. I have to do this. I have to do this. It's not in my control. My friends, and I know you teach this, you manage this. It is in your control. Yes. There is no outside door you know person out there that's causing all of this to happen you're right. in control yep so you open up the office you close the office there's no world any catastrophic uh, catastrophic event occurring here yeah so the thing is we're going to meet and greet we're going to give you about five minutes to do this by the way by the time we finish all this is going to add up to 60 minutes okay great now uh, tell me tell me what's happening in those five yeah. minutes hmm? Tell, tell us what's happening in those five minutes when you're yeah, meeting and greeting. We do that. Why don't we just get that uh, that uh, elephant in the room out of there, which you and I have talked about before. This can't be done in 30 minutes. This cannot be done in 30 minutes, even if you've got an assistant, uh, which is another, another kind of practice management scenario, but it can't be done in 30 minutes. There's no way it can be done in 30 minutes. I could probably help you out there for you want to do it in 45 minutes. But you're pushing the envelope, even with 45 minutes. But we could have that conversation. We could talk about where we're going to shave some points. Because really what we're doing is the slices in the pie are the same. We just made a smaller pie. Right. Okay. So please understand, we can't eliminate a slice. We can't eliminate a percentage of the slice. What we got to do is just have a smaller, a, 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 a smaller pie. 
Right. Can I ask you a question about that too, Sam? Because when you taught me about this years ago, you know, it's one of those things that it's so, you find that people are often successful. They do the opposite of what everybody else does. And I've even seen some young dentists now going to two hour hygiene appointments when they're just a scratch start and they've got nothing. I mean, when you don't have any patients, sometimes you see a hygienist and they're like, well, I only have three patients today. I'm like, well, open it up. And now you're going to see them for two hours. And they go, well, what would I do? And I'm like, well, you'll talk to them. And they're like, Right. Oh, you know, and that presents so that, an opportunity. Yeah. That's Absolutely. right. I mean, you have nothing else to do but squirt the air syringe at a bullseye that you create on a piece of paper. I can tell you, <laughs> take advantage of it. I mean, I, that's what I would do. Yeah. Uh, because, and again, as I mentioned at our last meeting, uh, the real, the real, where the rubber hits the road here is when a patient leaves, what do they say to the people around them when the husband when, when, when they come home from work, or when both of them come home from work and they're talking, what'd you do today? I saw the dentist. Uh, that conversation is, is the conversations that breed a practice. It's a relationship building. Right. So, so that first five minutes, uh, you got to have a smiley face on. You got to mean it. Uh, but you know something? You don't have a smiley face on, Kirk, when you are running 30 minutes behind. Right. You still don't have that on there. I mean, you may... You know, have a grin on your face, but when you're running, if you think about this, if ever, if you're five minutes behind on every patient, at the end of the day, I mean, you're in trouble. Yeah. As I mentioned before, when do you fly? You fly the first flight out in the morning. Don't fly that last flight out. Right. If you make any physician appointments, when do you want to make it? Eight o'clock. Don't right. make it at four o'clock because everything that happened. And, you know, sometimes I've been in that position where you are so behind, you actually say the dreaded thought. Yes. I wish there was a cancellation. Please right. let it be a cancellation. Right. Well, you, if you're in that position that you're wishing for a cancellation, you just look at how much money you made that week. But So don't complain because that mm-hmm. cancellation puts money out of your pocket. Right. You, you know, and this is for you to discuss in general, Kirk, as you know, just how to manage a practice. Um, so in that first five minutes, we're meeting and greeting uh, the patient. Uh, I believe, you know, you walk out to the reception area, the patient management area. Uh, you got a smile on your face. But can we back up for a moment? Yep. You better know that patient before you walk out there. And you know that I suggested before about grand rounds. Mm-hmm. Every single morning, everybody comes into the team room. Everybody has their charts. We sit around with our coffee and we go through every. You don't have to go through 10 or 15 minutes on every patient. All you've got to do is maybe one minute on every patient. But here's what you're telling the doctor you got to see this one. Mm-hmm. You got to spend some time with this one. This is the one that's been avoiding us. Yeah. It's the one that's been all gone for 12 months. So when you walk in, you got to drop that hammer, Doc. Mm-hmm. This is the one. This is the one that's been thinking about those three implants. They're pretty well ready. You know what this is? This is, you know what the recare is? It's leads. It's leads for the restorative dentistry that you haven't done. Right. And so when you walk out there, you already know that patient. You know that their son is at Clemson and she's about ready to gra- or he's about ready to graduate. I mean, you know that, pay- you know, if you go somewhere and people know you, maybe it's just our sort of in, maybe some inferiority, com- I don't complex we have, I don't know. But you know, when you go to a restaurant and especially with friends and the maitre d' knows you, mm-hmm. boy, that means everything. When, when you to have your tires, you know, replaced in, or you, you know, you take your car in, and they know you, wow, I mean, I don't care what generation you are, that still puts a little bit of, you know, sort of tickling on the spine, little goosebumps, because they know you. Yeah. And that's what what I hope that we're aiming towards oral health. So Yeah, can I ask you a question too, Sam, on that? Because I think what you're pointing to is, and tell me if you see this too, but we usually find that there's a practice within a practice. Sometimes there's two practices within a practice of just undiscussed dentistry. So a lot of times we go to an office, people want more, you know, they want to do a Facebook ad or a billboard. And I'm like, look at all this dentistry that's sitting in the operatives, you know? Uh, you You hit my, you hit a nerve. 
Because I see these folks that, you know, marketing to them is sending out postcards. Marketing to them is social networking. Now, I'm not taking anything away from that, but I think the social networking builds the icing on the cake. Right. Other practice management groups feel that it is the cake. I would absolutely disagree with that. Mm-hmm. You you are, you know, I've said before, I could, you know, sometimes I'll go into a practice and, you know, we're not getting any new patients, not getting new patients. What am I going to do? Mm-hmm. I, tell, I tell you what, I can sit in your hygiene operatory and totally build your practice. Yeah. So you're out there, you're out there struggling, talking to somebody on the phone how to get new patients. You're supposed to be in the recare operatory. And working on getting those patients, your your leads are your existing patients. Right. So I I hope that's in line with your philosophy Absolutely. and what you do with your clients. But um, you know it's and and that's where you know we dentists, if you don't have that charisma, then you better go take a Dale Carnegie course and get that charisma. Or, or you're going to be sitting out there with nothing else left to do because, in my mind, that's primary marketing. Right. Uh, you, you've got to be able to have the gift for gab. And yep. you know, so maybe let's one one slight step backwards there. You know, when you hire somebody, you you mention leaders. Mm-hmm. Now you you don't hire a tooth cleaner. Yeah. You hire you know somebody says well you know she's a little too gregarious. Fine, I right. can also slow somebody down, but I yeah. can't pick them up. Right. You want personalities, right? And you know, it's I can I can I can manage and educate someone how to do the technical aspects. It's hard for me to take somebody that doesn't have a personality or doesn't want to be with you. I mean, they can be the best periodontal maintenance management person that exists. Mm-hmm. That personality, that click. You know what you want? You want somebody who loves people. Yep. Amen, buddy. Right? You want yeah. somebody that loves. I would say if they can love people and be authentic with them, that's the other challenge I see, Sam, is that I love it when people are just honest. You know, don't, you know, sometimes you do see a hygienist who's really sweet, but she won't tell patients the truth. And that can lend itself to a whole nother challenge. And I think if you can love them and just tell people the truth and detach yourself from what you think a patient's going to say, because that's not your job. Your job is to the truth. And then their job is to decide. Exactly. Your your that's right. Your your position in, in a constructive manner is to tell them what is occurring, but it is their job to make the decision on where the direction goes. So uh, I don't. You know, I'm. I mentioned before. I'm a big Malcolm Gladwell fan, and his second book was Blink. Mm-hmm. And Blink. Uh, every every practitioner should read Blink. Yep. Because blink is, you know, when you see someone initially in those microseconds, both your patient and you, there's a lot going on there. And right. you can't hide behind some mask. Uh, so as, as Dr. Panky always said, like, likes, like. So when you have a, a dentist with a personality, they actually acquired a whole team with that kind of personality. So it sets the stage, doesn't it? It does. Uh, if you're running behind... Uh, and if you're angry at, at the practice because you're running behind, eventually that patient's going to see it. Uh, there's nothing worse than going out and having a patient that already is angry. Right. Now All take it. Angry. And because yeah. Happens, then before you know it, you're angry. And before <laughs> you know it, everybody's angry. And yeah. before you know it, you're having, you know, what I always say, you're having one of them cardiac days instead of the Nirvana day. Yeah. So as we go through this, I'm definitely not going to spend uh, 15 minutes talking about five minutes, but that very that part was very important. Right. So the next part becomes especially perio wise, but just in general, and that is as I mentioned before, our number one patient is going to be that baby boomer. Guess what? Them baby boomers they come in with shopping bags full of drugs. Uh, when you do a medical history now on the elderly or the baby boomer. Uh, it's not the same medical history as you do on an Xer or a millennial. Right. I mean, uh, you know, I'm not going to go into the philosophies and uh, politics of all of this, but, you know, a lot of folks are under the care of a lot of things that I'm not so sure sometimes they should be, but that's not my issue. Mm-hmm. But we are in a pharmaceutical age. Right. I mean, I turn on television. 
I mean, I'm listening to drugs that I have no idea what they are. I guess there are people out there who have these conditions. Uh, I know I don't have these conditions. I'm fortunate. You know, I'm, I'm glad because I'd be talking to my physician all the time. Mm-hmm. But the bottom line is, is that folks, folks are on a lot of meds. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, you go down and you look at the most prescribed meds, uh, you know, as far as um, uh, any, anything from the standpoint of uh, hypertensive medications. But my goodness, there's a lot of people on antidepressant, anti-anxiety meds. Uh, so, so it's very important to take a quality medical history. Now, here's the problem that happens with those medical histories. You know, you get to where you know someone so well mm-hmm. that you don't take the same kind of intense medical history as you did on a new patient appointment. Right. right. But, you know, and now even that started about 10, 15 years ago with all these Mother Earth facilities. Mm-hmm. So it's not just the prescription. You know, they were on St. John's Ward. I mean, there are some of these things you've got to talk about over the counter. Because in, in the past also, you know, mo- almost anything that was of any significance was a prescription. Mm-hmm. These days, that is not the case. OTC is a very important thing. Um, so you've got to ask them because there could be some blood dyscrasias. There could be some coagulation scenarios. Um, and I will tell you the other. Got to take a blood pressure. Yes. So Sam, how long? So, okay. So after we're doing the, the, the simple meet and greet, so this is five minutes until when within the pie. So after you've done the five minutes, now you're on your next five minutes, which is update the medical history. But please understand if you got a millennial there, that's as healthy as can be, mm-hmm. uh, that's going to take about 30 seconds. Right. But if you've got somebody that just had a cardiac stent or who's had a cerebral stroke, I mean, that's a, that's a different kind of issue. So there's a big wiggle room in that five minutes. As I always say, when you're in Florida, you know, or I just got back from Tucson, Arizona, there you're going to have to probably take about 10 or 15 minutes. <laughs> yes, you will. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, but it depends on the nature of your practice. But just, and, and you know, the other thing, and, and I have to say this because I'm a periodontist, there is something called the oral systemic link. Right. Right. Use it to your advantage. Yep. That's what we mean by that. Yep. If Absolutely. They back on the perio part, and all of a sudden now they're taking out, they come in and tell you, you know, now I've got a cardiac issue. I mean, don't beat on them, but take advantage of it. Yeah, absolutely. And so and immediately begin to bring in the link. Bring in the link. Now you have to, I like that. We can make that a slogan. Bring in the, And Dr. Chris Ramsey's watching. He said, amen to blood pressure. He also saved two lives that way, found a sleeper problem, which is true. Great job, Dr. Ramsey, because that's what you're going to find, Sam, in these early cases is when you're doing a good, um, getting a good medical health history and looking for the prescriptions, the blood pressure, I mean, that's going to, that opens, that's I mean, huge. you're that's- looking at things with new lenses when, when you see something on there. That is huge. Uh, it is just a routine. You come in for a post-op mm-hmm. to have sutures removed. We take a blood pressure. Right. We take a, you know, if I ever find, I'm a really nice guy, but if I ever find anyone on our team where we are not taking a blood pressure and that's not recorded uh, on that screen, then, you know, there's hell to pay. We, it is a routine aspect for us. Um, it, it, it is essential. You know, every now and then I, I've said to a practice, you know, do you take blood pressure? Well, I said, we got out that cuff, but we started to take it. The, the cuff disintegrated on us. So, mm-hmm. you know, uh, you know, that's, that's, we are our own worst enemy. I hope that dentistry, oral health care can survive and not go through a lot of auditing and a lot of this OSHA stuff and HIPAA stuff, right. but you know, we're on our own worst people. We, we got to right. maintain our standards. Or guess what? Someone's going to intervene, just like they do now in hospitals. And uh, but we, we we've got to do those blood pressures. We've got to do those medical histories. Got to do them right. Got to record them. Right. And don't just take for granted. Oh, you're the same patient. Da 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 da. Let's- I, I've got some questions too, Sam. Okay, because I love this. I, this is so good. And then Ramsey also said, as soon as the blood pressure is high, you want to call EMS. Now I do get this question. Because people, the little cuff ones, are they given accurate readings when you do the cuff ones or not so much? We do the cuff ones, but if it's anything out of the ordinary, you know, we go right back to the stethoscope and, and the cuff. Okay. Um, 
I, you know, we could probably spend a half hour, especially if we had a cardiac Sorry. doc on here about the cuff and the finger. Right. And, and um, but you know, and again, in a busy practice, uh, you know, you know, some some of the some of the wrist cuffs now are, are really really pretty good. But but you know, part of this also is what consistency. Right. And that's why you know you look back at the ones before. It's it's consistency. And I'm not going to get into truly the diastolic, systolic, as far as what should it be. You know, at one point we were only concerned about the diastolic. Now we're concerned also about the systolic. Right. Uh, but I will leave that up to the practices. But but I just I the only reason I do this is because we need to focus. I mean, uh, we got a we got we got 60 minutes on this. <laughs> yeah, let's keep going. We'll stay on the 60 hey, minutes because I. Two big and you know what? Hey, we, this is our own show, Sam. So you and I could talk for three hours on this. Oh, it, know, the sponsors aren't going to cut us off because there are no sponsors. To the audience. But anyway, take advantage of, of, take, of doing the medical history. And, uh, and, and also, I'm going to say one last thing on that blood pressure. Okay. Uh, don't let that white coat syndrome be the catch-all for everything. Saying, well, you know, my blood pressure is always high when I come in here. Well, yeah, that's fine. But today it's 200 over 110. Well, I'll tell you, that's more than just white coat syndrome. Right. Uh, and also, you, you, but you know, if, if you're rushing, they're rushing. I will say you do have to give them a little. That's why, you're, that's why your reception area, I love reception areas that are almost like zen, don't you? I yeah. mean, they got the incense burning, they got the music, they got the fountains. I mean, I, I love those kinds of offices uh, to where, because most people coming in, most people in my practice are working people. Uh, and I must tell you, they come in, actually, the, the oral practitioner, healthcare practitioner, it actually ought to be a place to where they can do what? Ah, <sighs> that's the kind of office you want. Right, that, right. Ah, <sighs> you know, that music, you know, because that's what we do. I mean, they'll say, you know, well, you really like that new age music. Well, you know, I'm not working, Birken, work, you know, wearing Birkenstocks, but... You know, I need that music too. Uh, so you see, how we're turning the. We're actually going from a complete different polarization, from actually going to a dental office where I'm just scared as hell, mm -hmm. to an office to actually I like going there. Yeah, that's right? cool. That's what that to me, and nobody. Yeah. And so, can I just say one thing about the dental hygienist? Please, nobody does better zen than a dental hygienist. Mm -hmm. I mean, we love them. Yep. I mean, nobody does it better than them. Right. I mean, they they know how they just have those personalities. I, I when I was speaking in Arizona, I said, you know, the number one group I like to speak to. Not not take anything away from you dentists out there, but boy, you love those hygienists. I mean, they laugh at your jokes. Mm -hmm. uh, they never fall asleep. They're sponges. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm you know, hygiene hygienists are just really a really special group. Yeah. So, so well, we're then, at 10 minutes. So what, what happens after 10 minutes? Clinical exam. Okay. How long is clinical? clinical exam. <clears throat> and you do it right. Okay. You do a quality restorative exam. You on my remember you referred back to your notes before that patient walked in there. Right. So you're not blinded here. So you do a good clinical exam. You're looking at those notes of the things that you've been monitoring. Got to be careful about watching it. Mm -hmm. You ever heard that thing where we're watching it? I or, hate watching it. We call it minimizing language. You don't want to use the word watch or just. I mean, what are we going to do? Watch it do flips or it's just it's a little exactly. bleeding. I mean, are you just a little pregnant too? So um, you got to be careful about that watching it. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, and, and I'll tell you another one that's one of my favorites. We'll do it next time. Yes. We'll do it next time. Okay. We'll do it next time. And then when you're under that litigation, you know, and you got that expert witness, they don't understand, or the judge doesn't understand, we'll do it next time. The state board doesn't understand, we'll do it next time. Right. So what we're trying to do is, but you're doing a 35, 30, 45 minute appointment. You see, that's what happened. That's when that gets into, we'll do it next time. Mm -hmm. So we're going to do a good clinical exam, but it is very methodical. It's all, right. you know, and now see, before on that first five or 10, 15 minutes, we're being, we were being very personal, weren't we? Right. We need to know the patient, enjoy the patient, understand the patient. But when we go in the mouth, all that stuff that we did before, that doesn't bias what we're looking for. Right. This is a pure straight. It's almost like when I turn my car back in to Avis, they go around the car to make sure there is no dings. Yeah. Now, just because I want to come in there with a smiley face and I crush the headlight, I'm still going to have to pay Avis for that light. Right. So 
here is a very methodical exam. I believe that it's, a, you know, I think we talked about dimming before. To me, it is, it is like, a, it, you know what it is, Kurt? It's a checklist. Yes. When you go in that restroom to see if it's clean or not, it's a checklist. Right. You know, and people don't do checklists. You remember there was a, remember that uh, internal medicine person? That, checklist Manifesto. They wrote that book on checklists. Yeah. And I think with John Hopkins, where they find out people didn't die as much when they had a checklist. Right. Yeah. So it's a checklist. So what are we going to do? Uh, we're we're going to do a quality restorative examination. We're going to do a quality periodontal examination. But hang on. There is one examination we're going to do first before anything. What's that? And I don't know if you just saw this, but I was either in uh, Dr. Bracuspid or what have you, but a study just found that only 20% of dental practices do a head and neck exam. Really? 20%. Wow. 20%. Now, why is that? Just time? For I, it, 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 you know, it all really comes down to time. Right. They're already running behind. My goodness, you can't, you, you, you know, you and I killed, you know, well, by, by what I'm like, we already killed about 40 minutes talking about 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. it, it's time, but you've got to do that head and neck examination. Oh, yeah. You've got to do it right. But if you do it right and you, you're, you're, you're trained in it, educated in it, it doesn't take more than two or three minutes. No. Now, there's probably going to be some docs out there. They're going to say, well, you know, you got to do this. You got to do this. You got to do this. You got to be practical. You got to be practical in dentistry. I mean, uh, we're not an oral pathologist taking this thing, but there are some things that you do. I mean, you, you know, you look at the tongue or you look at the palate. You take the denture out. I mean, you look at this stuff. I mean, right. you look at the throat. You know, do some, some palpation for the nodes. Right. You do some things. For me personally, it does not take me more than two to three minutes. And you know something? You always tell the patient what you are doing. Right. Now, I have a question on that, Sam. So when you're doing a clinical exam, I want to talk to you about that. Uh, and then Chris Ramsey asked the question, um, ask him his position when the patient declines an X-ray or anything else. Ah. We were, you know, we he says we refuse to treat, um, but in their no nonsense. But what do you think when, when exactly. a patient refuses it? Okay. You know, there's a myth out there that if you sign a waiver, it's okay. okay. I don't know where we got that, but when I've been an expert witness, by the way, never for the patient, only for the doc, mm -hmm. I will tell you, I have never seen that admissible in a court of law. Right. You, if someone needs radiographs, you can't have someone sign something and refuse radiographs. It doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. um, you've got to do what is best practices. Right. And so therefore, I'm right there with Chris on that one. Uh, they refuse radiographs. Got to tell you, they're not in the practice. Right. They're yeah. not in the practice. So let me ask you this too. The clinical exam, typically, how long does that last? Because I'm trying to, I'm filling up my pie here. And so, um, 10, minutes. 10 minutes. Okay. 10 minutes because you got your act together. You've right. done the rehearsal. You know, you know the deal here. Uh, now, you, you know, in a new patient periodontal examination, that itself takes 10 or 15 minutes. But we're not doing a new patient periodontal examination. We're only looking at the areas of concern. Right. And, and so let me help you with that. What that means is, on the average, only 15% of the teeth have periodontal problems in the average periodontal patient. Isn't that amazing? That is amazing. Only 15% of the teeth. Now, naturally, it's the molars. Uh, mm -hmm. but, but when we say, do you, you know, every now and then someone says, well, do I do a complete periodontal charting, writing the numbers down? You gotta be kidding me. Mm -hmm. Most of these agents don't have anybody in the room writing numbers down, which by the way, is a plug for Florida probe. Yeah. Uh, you know, sorry, a voice works voice works is that, that little person on your shoulder that does the exam. So, you, you know, so these kinds of technology things are very, very helpful. Uh, also, let me, and I'm not going to put anything about any company, but my goodness, hygiene operatories that don't have intro oil cameras, give me a 357 Magnum, let me shoot myself. <laughs> you kidding me, in 2017, not yeah. an oil camera. I'll go I don't get practices it. where they say, well, we've got one. You mean you go from operator to operator looking where the camera is for something that costs like $500? Mm -hmm. You know, at five hundred dollars, right? That five hundred dollars can it's going to sell a hundred thousand dollars. Absolutely. So come on, I mean, don't, you know, don't be so cheap. Get that intro camera out there and show them. Right. 
Oh, so we're taking that 10 minutes. We've done the intra oral, ex uh, the uh, or oral cancer exam. We've done the restorative exam. Uh, we've done the periodontal exam. Uh, we have, uh, as far as uh, you know, occlusion. I'll leave that up to the practice. Uh, but there, and now with uh, with uh, the the sleep stuff, you know, there's questions that you can ask. Uh, but but for the most part, you, you're completing that exam in approximately 10 minutes and recording, you know, recording your results. Uh, by the way, uh, again, sorry, I'm a periodontist. We got to look at the oral hygiene. Right. We've got to look at that oral hygiene. But that oral hygiene really fits when we're starting to actually do the debridement. Mm -hmm. And the oral hygiene uh, aspect of it is this is where you got to tread lightly. Okay. So you can, I got some of these, I got some of these dental hygienists, they're like trolls under the bridge. <laughs> and they walk in there and say, well, I ain't got to tell you, you're still not cleaning these areas. Mm -hmm. You know, if you don't clean these areas, you're going to lose your teeth. Right. Oh, so I can tell you, some personalities might be receptive to that, but when you're a CEO of a company and you got some dental hygienist telling you that you should be flossing more, mm -hmm. that doesn't go over real well. Right. Now, right. And I could spend a whole other time about how to do oral hygiene, but right. I just know that I'm a fanatical person on electric brushes. If I had yes. my way, there'd be no manual toothbrushes in a dental practice, get over it. Right. If I had my way, get over this dental flossing thing, they're not going to use it. You know, you should be using things like I mentioned before, like um, uh, Sunstar Butler Soft Picks. Yep. At a, and I, one of my most favorite is Philips Sonicare Air yep. Floss. Uh, you want to you you want to use a water pick? That's fine with me too. I'm not going to get hung up on this, but I love uh, the the Philips Sonicare Air Floss because yep. to me is Tesla is technology. <laughs> I love those soft picks. I I love them to death. I think you can do an incredible amount of quality oral hygiene. But you know yep. what it really comes down to customized what? oral hygiene to the patient. Mm -hmm. Put cookie cut in this thing. By the way, you don't need disclosing solutions. All yeah. the solution to is get all over you, get all over them, get all over the sink. You don't need it. Mm -hmm. Pick up an uh, intro camera, pick up a, you know, I tell you what the best camera is. What's that? And mirror from Walmart. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's a, a hand mirror from Walmart always works. Right. And I've also seen on the mirror overhead lamps, a lot of people will mount the mirrors. Yeah. You, are you a big fan of that? Standing. Outstanding. Right. Anything to be able to look in their mouth and be able to record it. And here's here's what we record. Here's the only okay. thing you need to record. Good, fair, poor. That's about it. That's it. Either good. Now, by the way, I did create an index. We can talk about that some other time. But I did create a really simple index you can do in like two minutes. Uh, no, excuse me, 30 seconds on oral hygiene. It's a score. Okay. That uh, If folks want to, they can email me. I'll give them. I'll send them the reprint. What we found out was we used this index. We created a new index about 15 years ago. We compared it with doing every single tooth. In other words, finding, finding biofilm on every tooth versus my index, we were within 5 to 10% every single time. Wow. My index takes 30 seconds. So if, you, uh, if somebody emailed me, I can send them the, the little uh, scoring system, the little reprint system. But don't, you know, just don't get hung up on it. But you know what it is? Be constructive. Don't be right. punitive. Be right. constructive. And you know something? If they're not going to do it after two years, get over it. Right. You know, Absolutely. Don't spend another 20 minutes on oral hygiene with somebody that's, that's been in your practice 20 years. Do you think you're going to change them? No. Throw them right. in the chair, get out the ultrasonic, and go crazy. I don't really mean it that way, but yeah. you know what I'm saying. So let's keep going on our pie. So okay, what? Uh, so, uh, basically, after we've done our oral hygiene, our head and neck exam, now we're going to do the part called my, you know, my most favorite part called the subgingival debridement. Okay, walk us through that. And how long okay. is subgingival debridement? What do you yeah, typically? So here, here we go. Uh, th this is where some of our, our folks on the call are probably going to have an arrhythmia. <laughs> uh, you may need to call EMS after this, but here we go. Okay. This is 2017. Throw those curettes and scalers out the door. Come on. Mm -hmm. I have the science. And I don't, you know, we'll, you want to have another session on the science, but the science demonstrates that it is absolutely not 
necessary to ever pick up another curator scalar for the rest of your life. This is called ultrasonics. Ultrasonics have been around since 1956. I don't care whether you use piezos. I don't care whether you use magnetostrictive. Great companies out there. Uh, it depends upon your personal preference, but it has to do with micro thin tips. Right. Micro thin tips and how you use them. But your your hand can't move 30,000 cycles a second. I don't know why you're still using those scalers and curettes. I'm not using a belt driven hand piece. I'm using electric or air turbine. I don't know why you're using those. Nets. I know. I know why, Sam, because that's the way we've always done it, which is the worst reason to do anything. Anyway, because we've always done it. I <laughs> love our dental schools and our hygiene schools, but I will tell you what we are starting to see. Dental hygiene educators introducing ultrasonics first. It's awesome. And those surveys are now showing that. So hand, my hat is off to companies like Densply and Hufridi, those you know, companies that are really pushing power-driven instrumentation. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that right there will substantially decrease the amount of time. We're giving this 25 minutes, however. Okay. And we're giving it 25 minutes because this is the most important part mechanically of what we're doing. Uh, it may be less than that for what we call the gingivitis patient. I'm, you know, I almost said the P word. I almost said the prophy patient. Right. But it, the, it, the more we perpetuate that prophy, the, the, I, I actually call it buckets, the gingivitis patient. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and there are patients that don't even have gingivitis. Uh, I'll leave that up to you. Uh, we're, we're at the end. We'll talk about three months, six months, twelve month free cares and that. But for right now, the the biggest slice of the pie for the sixty minutes is at the chair subgingival device. Now, can you just pause and say why? Because I get that, but I think if you're a young dentist and you're watching this, how important is this to everything you do? Every single study ever done in the history of periodontics demonstrates that the most effective procedure in keeping teeth is the 25 minutes. Bingo. Say as you want, but for the last 40 years, periodontal debridement, gingival debridement, notice I don't say scaling and root planing, is the most effective appointment in keeping teeth. So if we pull the Stephen Covey thing, the seven habits of highly effective people, and we right. adhere to it, find the procedures that have the science that show that's the most effective. Don't get that hygienist to where they're running out of time. Right. And what do they do? They start shortchanging every one of these slices. Right. Now, can I ask you a question? Is this true? Is the acid test, if you're a restorative dentist, if you're prepping and you're seeing a lot of blood when you're prepping, that's just a clear indicator of what's happening in those 25 minutes. Would you say that's true or not true? Because that's a little controversial. It's a combination of both. Okay. It's a combination of what they're doing at home and it's a combination of what's going on at the chair. Right. I put everything into two buckets, chair and home, chair and okay. home. Again, please understand, I am not suggesting that patients spend 10 minutes a day oral hygiene-wise because they're not going to do it. If right. you two minutes out of them, you're doing fine, but it should be done at night. Right. All oral hygiene should be done at night. Absolutely. So that, that, so, but I, I'm going to throw another one in there for you. Please. You talked about the, because in my mind, ultrasonic, the way we have ultrasonics today with micro-thin tips, that is new technology. Mm -hmm. I'm going to throw another one in for you. And that is air polishing. Not the air polishing that we're used to. Okay. Not, this, not this thing that we talk about relative to uh, sodium bicarbonate with, um, I, didn't want, I don't want to use the brand name, but I'm not talking about that big old hunk, uh, air polishing stuff where it looks like it's snowing in Buffalo. You know, I'm <laughs> talking about that. I'm talking about the new kids on the block with these glycine air polishing devices. Mm -hmm. Several companies are making them now. EMS comes to mind. There are several companies that have been in Europe for the last decade, and they blow the heck out of biofilm. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. So what you got here is you got your ultrasonics knocking out the hard stuff, the calculus. 
you got those super and subgingival glycine air polishers knocking the socks off of biofilm. And if you do head-to-head -head, uh, time trials, in other words, putting a hygienist with an ultrasonic or scalar in one operatory removing biofilms, and they're using the subgingival air polishing in the other, the time difference, the time motion stuff is not even close. Yeah. Yep. So now do you see how I'm squeezing this thing down to where I want more time talking with the patient, finding what's going on with the patient before we actually go chair side. Amen. And you know, when we were doing that exam, you know, uh, we talked before about uh, um, Bob Barkley talking about co-diagnosis. When we're doing that exam, that patient knows everything we're doing. And that's where all those little pieces, before we did that debridement, all those little things that we reinforced. Have you thought about how you're chewing? Is that is that area where you're missing that tooth? Is that still okay? Mm -hmm. If you don't say anything, they won't say anything. Right. You know, I always find it interesting when a patient comes in and you say, how are you doing? Is everything okay? You know what they say? Yeah. yeah. It's fine. It's fine. Mm -hmm. I'm okay. I came in here just for my cleaning. I'm bringing my car in for the car wash. Great. That's not what this is. There should be lead, lead, um, I don't know what you would, you, you probably have it something in the, your practice. Nurture, nurture, I like the word nurture. You nurture, but you've got, you, you actually have a little parking lot. That's what I want. So you have a parking lot of things that need to be done that they haven't agreed to do yet. Right. Now I've got, a, I've got a couple things because I'm taking tons of notes here. Another thing, and I'm tracking you, Sam, this is awesome. Another thing, if you're a hygienist or a dentist watching this, this is key. And I see this a lot and I'm sure you see the Sam. People have these big monitors in their offices or in the hygiene ops and they've got CNN playing on it all day long and they're replaying the school shooting that happened this morning or yesterday and you're trying to communicate with the patient and you're both terrified. You know, you're watching or there's a political conversation that's going on. I think you have to be incredibly intentional. You talked about the, you know, intraoral camera. Everything that goes in through those eyes of the patients has to condition their brain. So we teach all of our practices. You only have one channel running through your whole practice. It's called the food network. That's it. If you're going to show anything on TV other than the patient, then it's the food network because everybody loves food. So what do you see? I could not agree more. I, I even go into the Delta Sky Club. And they got CNN on. It just totally changes. I mean, we are, you know, you want to go watch the news, put, put on XM when you leave here. Right. But I think it, you know, we said, you know, wait a minute, we're following my, when we said about the Zen practice. Yeah, absolutely. The Zen practice. Zen you know, practice. I say put on National Geographic, but I don't want <laughs> air to run up some lamp. So yeah, so, so let's go back. 25 minutes, subgingival debridement. What, where are we going? I just want to make that real pitch because right. selling dentistry is that hygienist, by the way, if, if your practice is an implant practice, he or she as a hygienist should know everything there is to know about implants. Right. He or she, they should be the encyclopedia. Right. Uh, by the way, you notice that the doctor hasn't come in there yet. Yes. I'm going to tell you when they come in. Please. They can come in after the first 20 minutes. Okay. Tell us why. Because after the first 20 minutes, everything else, the data collection's already been done. Right. So now you've got a 40-minute lead time that the doctor can come in. The doctor is not supposed to come in until the hygienist has completed the 20 to 25 minutes. Powerful. Absolutely. And so we're going to talk about when the doctor comes in, and we're going to talk about how we do that. But, but so that that twenty five to thirty minutes of super gingival, sub gingival debridement, please think about the only two things we use are ultrasonics and glycine air polishing. Okay. That is it. It reduces the chair time substantially, providing the time for the other. Awesome. Now, once you've done that, got to tell you. You're now at the five minutes of dismissing the patient or, for the most part, when the doctor comes in. Okay. When he or she comes in. Now, remember, we set the stage on 
high level, low level, medium level, as far as when the doctor comes in, how important it is for them to come in. Some, some patients, you're coming in just to say hi. Right. Some patients, you're coming in to have an intense conversation about their oral health. Okay. Now, let's go through the prompting because the prompting is something that the dentists kind of uh, get tripped up on. As a hygienist, you're not just going to let the patient walk in, you know, the dentist walk into the room and just let rapport take over. You know, what do you believe about cueing the dentist about what the hygienist has learned? Like, walk us through that inside the – because there's some things that happen behind the scenes that aren't so yeah. apparent to the patient. Right. If it is something that should be said without – the patient in the room. I mean, without, uh, with, 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 if it's a conversation that should occur beforehand, then the hygienist leaves the operatory being courteous and talks with the doc before they come in. Okay. Sometimes that happens. Mm-hmm. I'll have it constantly. Maybe, maybe it is a head and neck issue. Mm-hmm. Maybe, you know, maybe there's something on the side of that tongue that needs to have a conversation before you walk in there. Maybe it's a patient's attitude mm-hmm. that you're kind of sensing that there could be some litigation here. Right. You know, how come you didn't tell me? You know, uh, that's that's where the smarts of a hygienist. Hygienists can't walk in there all of a sudden after attending one of Sam's courses and tell everybody that walks through there, you got gum disease, you're going to die, you're going to lose your teeth, and, you know, don't do that. Uh, no. You know, you, you, as, as we always say, you got to plant the seed and then fertilize the seed. But there are times when, you, you know, you need to come in there and chat with that dentist off-site before you walk into that operatory. Right. Right. You know, it shouldn't be that often. Right. It's, You've done your, you know, you've done your good due diligence, but if there's something really there, or maybe it's this. Right. Maybe now, the, maybe the patient is saying, you know, I think I sort of want those implants. Right. Right. Now, let me go back to this because I get this question all the time too, Sam, and I'm just going to ask you. Some hygienists are reserved about talking about what they see and what the doctor might do. We call them pre-diagnostic conversations because the whole fly right into the face of the storm. Hygienists can't diagnose, but there's no law that prevents them from saying to a patient what they think, right? I'm thinking. T- tell us your thoughts on that. Got to be careful. You got to be careful, but where? What would you say to a hygienist or a dentist that's watching this? I like them to reinforce the things we've already found. Okay. But if it is really something really, really new, right? They really should talk with the doc, and I'm I'm going to show you what we mean by that. Okay. I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm with you. And some practice acts now are actually like in Colorado. Uh, uh, hygienists can actually die. You can diagnose what you, what you treat. Mm. I believe in that by the way. And I hope none of the hygienists on this call beat me up. Mm-hmm. Some of the hygienists on the call will beat me up because the doctor isn't diagnosing. Right. So compelled. I mean, what do you do? Uh, this is a whole nother conversation, but what do you right. do? You got a patient with severe periodontal disease. The hygienist doesn't know what to do. They know what should be done, but the practice just isn't engaging in perio right now. I mean, that's right. a whole conversation it is it is so but but here's the way you know you're right it, it's sort of a case-by-case case kind of thing but there's no reason for it that if a high if if you've already diagnosed perio mm-hmm. there's no reason for a hygienist not to be talking to the patient about this area is bleeding this area you know you need to put some more uh, uh emphasis on oral hygiene in this area right. um you know because you just have to be slightly careful, but I'm not saying that a hygienist just being, you know, moot on the whole thing. Right. Uh, if it's new things. If it's really new, new things, they've got to be very careful of bringing that up in front of the patient. Okay. Sounds good. Now let's keep going back to our pie in the perfect 60 minutes when you, let's go into the doctor's exam. So the doctor, in, so the doctor comes in. Uh, and here is the way that we, we, we do this. And uh, did, I, did I tell you about my experience with the GI doc last time? Maybe No, I, I can't remember that one. Okay, so uh, I go in to see the GI doc on a routine colonoscopy, and it's in phenomenal office. It's uh, French paintings, everything. And 
And so when I walk in, I mean, it, it's just the very office that you and I are talking about. There's not CNN on there. There's some uh, classic uh, uh, music being played. Uh, the, it's subdued lighting. It smells good. And she comes out in a white coat, and it's actually clean. And she's not the doc. She's the doc's, not even his nurse practitioner. She's just a team member. But she brings me back in into the into the, the the room, and she asks me questions, and she really is very methodical about it, but being very nice, establishing rapport. Then he comes in. Guess what? He's dressed in a tie and a shirt, and he actually looks professional. And the jacket is white. And by the way, the operatory is really clean. And by the way, I wasn't in there for more than five or ten minutes this entire time, and so. He meets and greets me. He asks me some great questions, everything. But then he begins to examine me. As he examines me, she is giving him all the information verbally that she found in front of me, within earshot of me. Mm -hmm. So isn't that phenomenal? And you could probably see both of them instead of having one of them be behind you, right? Both of them were in front of me, and she's saying, uh, well, well, well uh, Dr. Kramer, uh, uh, well, Dr. Lau, uh, has, uh, he's not having any stomach issues. He's coming in for his, for a routine colonoscopy. By the way, this is his first one. So I've, I've gone through uh, with him about uh, what to do and everything. And, but, you know, the point is, is as he's examining me, he's not wasting any time looking at everything she's put into the computer. Right. And so it's really, I think it's phenomenal co-diagnosis. I left that office and went to my practice that afternoon. We had a meeting of the minds, and that's what we started from then on. That's awesome. Hygienist. And, you know, and, and, and so Misty um, uh, will say, and, and, and Dr. Lau, uh, uh, Jane's oral hygiene today is, is really only fair, but, but, but she's going to work hard. And she's going to do some of the things. We actually suggested, Dr. Lau, that, that she actually needs to really not use that manual brush anymore and only use the electric brush. And I showed her how to use that electric brush. And, and she's well on her way. And I know we're going to see improvement in, in the future. You, you know, just framing it like that. Mm -hmm. But Dr. Lau, we did see, and I showed her this area, we did see an area that was bleeding that we didn't see before. And I, I told her I marked it in the chart. I showed her. But that's the, that's the area, that's one of the areas I want you to look at first, Dr. Lau. And I say I'm already at the chair with the mm -hmm. person looking. That's you know, it, mm -hmm. it, it is, again, it's going back to dimming with zero defects. It's about how you build a Corvette, but it's also about personalization before you actually start building the Corvette. Right. Um, that, that, that appointment should not be more, you know, if you've got only one hygienist, and you're seeing every patient as a doctor, and you're seeing eight patients a day, you're spending 40 minutes in a hygiene laboratory. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I want you to see a patient, but my goodness, you've got to be over in your laboratory doing some work, too. Right. But you right. see what they're doing, so they're, they're throwing out the baby with the bathwater. They're running so behind, they either don't see the patient, or they run in their run out. Right. And, and that's not, it has to be, as I started the conversation with you, it has to be a meaningful appointment. Right. Now, I'm gonna, I want you to speak about that because some hygienists are watching this and they go, Sam, it's really easy for you to say, but my doctor comes in and chats up a storm sometimes and it ends, it's not five minutes. You know, he's talking or she's talking. So what, what would you say about that when you go back to the meaningful appointment? What would you say to a doctor who's just chatty all the time? You have to walk into the doctor's door and say, listen, Sam said it's extremely <laughs> important that we stay on schedule. Yes. Our patients deserve it. If, if you're, you know, especially baby boomers and the elderly. Yes. If, if They're paying for 60 minutes. By the way, this is not some $90 deal here. This yeah. is a $50 deal. Well, and you know this, a big part of the reason a hygienist is not on time isn't always the hygienist. It's the doctor. No, I will tell you, I, 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 if, I, if I had a PowerPoint, I'd show you. We, we have something we call a fishbone diagram. I don't know if you've ever seen these in, uh, um, 
in strategic planning, but you at the at the mouth of the fish, you put down the problem. Mm -hmm. And on the fins of the fish, you put everything that contributes to the problem. And you go around the room and you ask everyone. So I, I'll tell you really quickly what it is. Uh, one, uh, patients can be late. Can you fix that? You bet. You have the 15-minute rule. Right. Now, if they're fit more than 15 minutes late, don't dismiss them. Because right. if you dismiss them, you've lost an appointment. No, if they're more than 15 minutes late, you still go ahead and see them, but it's two appointments. If they're right. very patient. Yep. They're yep. two appointments. But you're very nice about it. Um and, and the, the second thing is, is dental assistants can cause you to run late. Uh, turnover of sterilization can cause you to run late. Please, don't be so cheap that you've only got four kits and you're running so fast that you can't turn them over from the standpoint of sterilization. Right. I mean, I'm a, you know, you just can't do that. So we go through this whole thing. Um, uh, one of my real pet peeves, patients sitting in the reception area, no one knows they're there. Mm -hmm. That right. does happen. That happens. You know, I always say, I guess some uh, elderly lady is in there knitting. No <laughs> one knows she's there. I guess she came in out of the Florida sun because it was air conditioned. <laughs> so, but, but, but you're right. The biggest fin on the fishbone is the doctor. Right. And the primary one is not necessarily the chatty Cathy, but doing a totally complete treatment plan in the hygiene operatory. Mm. Now, if they break a cusp off, that's one thing. But you're talking about a patient's missing 10 teeth that you gave them a comprehensive treatment plan, and now all of a sudden they won the lotto, mm -hmm. should reappoint them. Right. Don't do all of this in the hygiene operatory. Right. Now, take us through the verbal skills of that because you do that so well. So when you see a patient's got a lot going on, what would you say? You've seen a lot of people do this. What's the best way to do this verbally? You mean if they are willing now to accept the plan or you're in their no, just the plan? Well, you just see there's a lot going on. So instead of doing what you just proposed, which is writing up the treatment plan there and you invite them back, what's the best verbal skills to say, hey, look, Mrs. Jones, there's a lot going on here. You know, we're going to have you back. And uh, is that you know, typically what you see? We always do. And we say it over and over. We're here for you. Mm. We're here for you. Okay. I appreciate the financial part right now. I tell you, I appreciate it. I understand it. But the most important thing is I want you to be able to eat well, function well, look great, and not have any systemic issues from this. Right. I know you and I can find a compromise to where we can get this thing done. Mm -hmm. So let me tell you phase one, phase two, phase three. And you tell me what you think. Okay. Yes, you can do. You know the right. worst thing you can do? You know, you you mentioned about these 32, 33-year-old dentists. They see a patient come in. They see a hot one. They turn on the charm. They start trying to put something on patients that really need it. Mm -hmm. But patients haven't accepted it. You know what you say? You better make sure it works. Because if it doesn't work, I will tell you, there will be your nightmare for the rest right. of your life. Right. You know, you can't sell people something they don't want. Right. You can write work, but you can absolutely educate them to where they are what's called the, you know, the educated consumer. Yeah. So now the doc, with the doctor exam, so take us through that. Now, how, any other points you, you see in the doctor's exam on my pie as I put this all together? How do you finish the appointment, bring it to close? Tell, tell me your thoughts on that. Well, if there is, if, you know, if, if there is anything, we, we like the reappointment. Okay. In other words, if it, if it even smells marginal, we like to bring them back on the doctor's book. That's the best thing you could ever do. Right. Now, you might, if it's something you think you can, uh, you know, wait to the next recare, but, you know, let's face the psychology of this. And many times, a six-month recare ends up being a one-year recare. A right. three-month recare ends up being a six-month recare. So, you, you know, you've got to be careful. I find it much more effective when you pull them out of the recare cycle and put them on the doctor's book. Okay. 
I, I find because then they know you mean. Now think about your own self. You go for be care. Well, we're going to watch it, and we'll we'll see how you're doing the next time you come in. Versus, we at this point believe that you need my undivided attention. Right. And I'm going to have in. Have you come back in? Or you and I just have a conversation. And by the way, just let me. Re- you know, I, I'll say this every now and then. And sort of let me go over this again in my own head, just to see to make sure this is what we really want to do. Right. That's great. That's great. Now, um, as well, far as I, I will tell you one other part, please. A very interesting part. We have the hygienist also have the accounts receivable on the computer. Okay. Tell me why. Well, we believe that the hygienist should say to the patient, I note that you may have an outstanding balance. Mm-hmm. When, you, when I take you up to the, the, the patient manager, they will probably have that conversation with you. Right. That's all we ask. Yep. Yeah, and we do that in our morning halls. We teach all of our, you know, with a little red marker, all the balances are listed. So you'll know. You never have to look it up. It's right there in front of it's you. Right there. You're so, preconditioning the patient for what's going to happen at the front. Yeah, I just will say, well, you know, I'm not supposed to be collecting the money. I didn't ask you to collect the money, but I ask you to be part of this. Right. You cannot separate care from money. Not in 2017. They're linked at the hip. Right. So, and by the time you finish, hopefully that's a 60 minute. Oh, but I didn't put in the last five or 10 minutes. And that is somebody's got to clean up that operatory. Somebody's going to enter all that data into the chart. So okay. you stop, watch it. You see it is a 60 minute deal. All right. So five, 10 minutes to turn it over, turn the room over. Um, and then you mentioned this in the middle of our conversation is the whole debate on the 30, 45 minutes, 60 minute appointment. Anything you want to add to that? Because I find a lot of people philosophically go, Dr. Lau, you're spot on, but you know what? How do I transition from where I'm at to that in a blended practice? Like you mentioned, blended, private, and PPO. I'll tell you, I'll tell you one so, way to do it. Please. It's going to cost you about $40,000 a year, $45,000 a year, put in a dental assistant. Mm-hmm. Okay, tell us more. Run two, run two operatories and have a dental assistant uh, in there doing every delegable duty possible. Mm-hmm. And having the dental hygienist doing more at what's at the chair. Right. Um, but the whole first five or 10, 15 medical history, all of that legally can be done by a dental assistant. Yep. And anything that is a, uh, not a delegable duty to a, a dental assistant, uh, I sometimes will see, uh, I don't, and it's conceivable you can do this. I work in some practices where we've got uh, two hygienists and one dental assistant holding between the two. Mm-hmm. You can pull off a 45 minute appointment if you've got a dental assistant assisting the dental hygienist. Right. And that's not unusual in a practice. It's just that you've got to really determine who does what. Right. You've got Absolutely. to really define it and it has to be written down who does what. And yeah. I, care, I wish I could help you on the 30 minute. I just don't see it. I don't either. I, I don't, don't either. See. That's why I thought I'd ask the expert. So yeah. cool. Now, now, if somebody, peop- if, you know, I know you have a lot of these incredible handouts. If somebody wants to get in touch with you or get, you know, I've got your handouts. They're fantastic. How do I find you? Sam. Well, if you if you go to uh, you know um, um, my my email is um, Sam at uh, drsamlau uh, They can do that, or go on the website. You'll see the uh, email address. I'm very responsive. Actually, I do have a handout on okay. this very subject. And I'll be more than happy to send that to them. It'll be on a Dropbox. And uh, I have a complete, uh, this is a two or three hour course that I do at Hinman, et cetera. Uh, But I I will give them that handout. Uh, If you email me, I'll send the handout to you. It'll be in a Dropbox. So we'll use, link on Dropbox, it'll be a PDF file. 
That's awesome, buddy. I really, really appreciate this. You are fantastic. And so if you're watching this and you're watching it either during the live feed, like you are now, please add questions. Or if you're watching this later, please add a question. Again, we love your questions and we're giving away a special prize because we're just grateful for a lot of the questions every single week. Uh, we want to know what you're thinking. We also want to know what future episodes I can ask a perio master like Dr. Lau, because I'm going to have him back again and again and again, just on different uh, areas because this is such a critical piece to a great restorative practice. So thank you, Dr. Lau, for being on. I really, really appreciate it, my friend. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, you, you were spot on when you said the next thing we need to do is that 60-minute recare, and I, I hope that this uh, hit the hit the uh, the expectation of you in the audience. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Amen, buddy. Stay on here for just a second. If you're watching this, we're really grateful that you're watching the Best Practices Show. So until we see you next time, hope you guys have a great day, and thank you. Thank you.